Um, so hello and welcome to the lunchtime seminar series of the Geography Department at Trinity College Dublin. Um, please note that the, the seminar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Departmental Communications channels in the next few days. But my name is Tommy Gavin, I'm a PhD candidate here in the department and I'll be chairing today's session on behalf of Trinity Geography and I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Jenny C. Stevens, Professor of Sustainability, Science and Policy and Director of School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University in Boston. Trained at Harvard and Caltech, she's an educator, social justice advocate, and internationally recognized expert on renewable transformation, energy democracy, climate justice, and gender in energy. Professor Stevens' most recent book, Diversifying Power, Why We Need Anti-Racist Feminist Leadership on Climate and Energy, published by Ellen Press, inspires collective action with stories of innovative, diverse leaders who are linking climate and energy with jobs and economic justice, health and food, and transportation and housing. Um, Professor Stevens uses the term climate isolationism to describe the common framing of climate change as an isolated, discrete scientific problem in need of technological solutions. And two interconnected uh, concepts, energy democracy and climate justice, provide valuable frameworks for conceptualizing and implementing transformative change. So by prioritizing the potential for energy and climate action to diversify and distribute power, both concepts move beyond calls for technological innovation and instead prioritize investing in social innovation and the restructuring of society. So the seminar today uh, will take approximately 40 minutes and then we'll open it up to the floor for a question and answer discussion. Uh, so we'd ask you to please uh, mute your microphones and hold your questions until that time, um, but feel free to, to throw your questions uh, into the, the chat box um, and I'll, I'll group questions or we can do questions directly from the floor. But right now it is my great honor to hand things over to Professor Stevens. Great, well, thank you, Tommy. And uh, great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I am uh, currently in Boston and where I'm a professor and di the director of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs here at Northeastern. Um, but I am coming, I am Irish and I'm coming to Dublin next year. Um, and I'm gonna be having a visiting uh, research position uh, with all of you in, uh, in Trinity in the Department of Geography. So um, I hope that this, I will make this brief so that we can have some more interactive sessions, uh, discussion, and I look forward to meeting more of you in person um, soon. So um, I, I'm a very interdisciplinary uh, scholar and I have a, a integrated background and, and I, I think I'm, uh, what I'd like to do today is talk kind of frame the, the discussion about this, this recent book about power and how, how to diversify, distribute power um, as kind of a, a focal approach to thinking about climate and energy and sustainability and sustainable, sustainable environmental governance more broadly. Um, but I'd like, and then I'll um, also talk about some of my future research interests um, as we go through this. So let's see. Um, I, first, I'll begin and just introduce myself a little bit more. I was born in Dublin um, and my family moved to the United States when I was eight years old um, and to the Boston area. Um, I knew I was always interested in environmental science and policy. So my undergraduate degree was actually in the intersection of science and policy um, with a focus on water. And then I did my graduate work in California, um, still thinking about um, water, but then my PhD dissertation uh, moved from environmental chemistry in, in water and soils to thinking about carbon and carbon management and carbon in soils. So, um, and, and that was a technical degree in environmental science and engineering. But when I finished my PhD, I knew I wanted to get more into the social science. Um, so I uh, came back to the Harvard Kennedy School, the policy school at Harvard, and studied energy technology innovation. And there I really uh, developed kind of at the interface of uh, science and policy uh, with a focus on energy and climate. Um, I was a faculty member for nine years at Clark University in Worcester. Um, um, some of you may be familiar, they have a very strong geography department. So that was the first time I was in a university that actually had a geography department um, and was 
not in the geography department. I was in the environmental science and policy program, but I uh, had a lot of colleagues in geography that I collaborated with. Um, I was then a pro professor at the University of Vermont, uh, north of Boston, for a couple of years uh, with a focus on renewable energy. And I've been at Northeastern University, which is right in Boston, across the river from Harvard and MIT, um, for the past six years. Um, and because I've been here six years, I'm eligible for a sabbatical next year. And that's where I uh, plan to come back over to Europe and spend time be based in Dublin um, and look forward to um, collaborating and, and getting to know many of you um, it, with similar interests. So um, before I get started, I just wanted to kind of give a broad overview of some of the work that, that, I, that I do and kind of the interdisciplinary space that I publish in. Um, I've, I'm excited about a chapter that's coming out uh, to be published in May um, in an edited volume called Sacred Civics, Building Seven Generation Cities. Um, and in this chapter, um, I will be, I, I contribute kind of along along the same themes of the talk today about feminist anti-racist values in climate justice and how we move beyond this narrow framing of climate isolationism um, that really hasn't served us to get to the transformative um, approaches that are needed. And so just among the, the places that I've published recently, climatic change, global sustainability, energy research and social science. Um, and I also do quite a bit of uh, non-academic publishing. So I um, have, have published opinion pieces in Science, The Hill, Wall Street Journal, um, The Conversation, and some other, other venues. So, so just to give a sense of, I'm, I'm an engaged scholar who um, really am very interested in how we as academics and researchers and educators can use our platform to have a, have a broader impact uh, in addition to publishing in the academic journals and talking among ourselves, um, but really getting involved in policy and, and practice and, and social change. So um, I wanna begin by um, kind of connecting the challenges of climate and um, the energy transformation, moving away from fossil fuels toward a re more renewable-based future um, to economic injustice and this widening income and wealth gap. Um, and I'm increasingly interested in finance and the economic um, realities of, of what's preventing us from um, responding based on the science of what we know about what we should be doing or need to be doing as in humanity. Um, and um, the figure on the left here is uh, shows the United States uh, in terms of wealth and income, um, you know, increasing with the top one percent, while everyone else's um, economic situation is declining. And this was pre-pandemic. And you may have heard about a report just published last month by Oxfam um, that um, said how much wealth inequality has exacerbated during the pandemic. I think this report said that. The top 10 billionaires, all men, um, doubled their wealth since March 2020. So that shows how so much of our systems and economic policies and financial um, policies are set up to perpetuate this uh, concentration of wealth and power. And that is directly related to um, our inability or in incapacity. Uh, inability to adequately respond to the climate crisis for multiple reasons. And Dario Kenner um, uses this phrase, polluter elite, um, that the, the elites really don't want things to change, right? Because they're, they're making, doing very well with the current system. So they've um, really for decades uh, been making strategic invest in, investments to resist transformation. So we know more and more about the misinformation campaign to deny climate science and how a lot of fossil fuel interests in particular have been investing a lot of money in, to confuse people about the science of climate, um, but also very strategic investments in undermining public trust in government and, and minimizing worker protections and worker rights. Um, and that all uh, 
fuels to reinforce this concentration of wealth and power in a way that disempowers us to make the changes that are needed for um, uh, climate justice or climate stability um, and the energy system changes um, that are needed. So I propose in, in my book and in some of my writing that the climate crisis is really a crisis in leadership um, that is connected to this economic um, and financial situation and um, this phrase climate isolationism I use to describe the way mainstream climate policy has been framed and a lot of the climate discourse um, has been framed really in a very narrow technocratic way um, and it's kind of based on this idea that we can invest in technology and the technology will then uh, be able to um, you know mitigate all these the, the negative impacts of climate and, and, and I propose that this framing that's very technological and based on the science of climate science and then greenhouse gas emission reductions and decarbonization and, and this very technical way of thinking about the, the changes in the climate um, are really missing opportunities for investing in people and communities and improving the human condition. So an alternative frame that I um, have been using and a lot of folks have been using is, is this idea of energy democracy, which is about um, really investing in people and communities, uh, thinking about what people need, and basing those investments on social justice and human dignity, and, and recognizing the opportunity for if we invest in our energy system in a distributed uh, heterogeneous mix of renewables in different, different that's regionally appropriate in different parts of the world, um, we, there's an opportunity there to disrupt also these economic and political concentration of power. Um, and it's really leveraging the urgency of the climate crisis for social, uh, to distribute social and economic and political power, um, as well as, um, the physical energy power, right? Electricity and, and such. So, this idea of energy democracy is really about distributing power, redistributing power, literally and figuratively. Um, and it really recognizes that a lot of it has to do with ownership of infrastructure. Um, it's not just about the source of the fossil fuels or um, obviously one of the things that's so unique about renewable resources is that the resource itself, whether the wind, the flowing water, the sun, um, the geothermal energy is, is abundant, plentiful, reliable. We know it's always there. It's perpetual. It's free. Um, so once we invest in, in leveraging that and restructuring society around that, we, there's opportunities that are bigger than just uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, I guess, is one of the ways to, to think about it. So um, within that frame, um, I, a chapter one of my book is called Growing the Squad. And uh, this is where I start, I talk about leadership and, and different approaches to leadership and, and the values that we bring to our, um, to the climate and energy and sustainability uh, discourse. So um, the squad are these four junior Congresswomen here in the United States who came on the national scene just two and a half years ago, and they really changed the, the whole framing of, of climate policy. And, um, and they um, have altered the, our discourse more broadly about um, in, within society. Obviously, there's a lot of div divisiveness um, that we were all very aware of, and but but I think it's worth acknowledging that the kind of leadership that the squad have brought um, is really based on collaboration and inclusivity and participation, and the focus is about redistributing wealth and power, not concentrating it anymore, right? trying to disrupt those patterns that concentrate wealth and power, prioritizing investments in communities and worker rights, really focusing on reducing inequities and disparities by centering social justice, racial justice, economic justice, housing justice, um, and leveraging transformation by 
explicitly linking, helping people understand how all of these problems are linked, um, not keeping them in, in isolation. And so the antithesis of that kind of leadership is more traditional patriarchal leadership that's based on domination and exclusion, explicitly leaving people out so that the people who already have power can continue to have power. And that's how you co continue to concentrate wealth and power, prioritizing investments to maximize profits for those who already have a lot of wealth and corporate profits. Um, and that kind of approach relies on inequities and disparities and kind of exploitative and extractive uh, economic policies. Um, and clearly in that kind of uh, leadership, what we also see is deny a systemic uh, approach of denying problems, denying that there is a climate crisis, denying that we the pandemic is so bad, denying that, um, you know, that we have a housing crisis, denying that there's a problem with so many people living in economic precarity. Um, and so this is this is kind of the the um, the juxtaposition that I that I put forward here. And um, so what I did in my book is really it's not really a research book. It's more of a um, synthesis integrated book of just talking about and elevating some of the stories and some of the people and organizations and institutions that are um, just trying to disrupt the, the, the mainstream approaches that have been so ineffective. So um, one chapter of the book is about the elevating stories of people who are resisting the polluter elite, the power, the powerful of um, elites. And Jackie Patterson is one of those leaders. Um, she is the head of NAACP's Environmental and Climate Justice Program. And she and her team really did a lot of work um, pointing out how the fossil fuel industry in the United States was explicitly um, manipulating Black communities in particular to offering sometimes financial, um, some local benefits to get a, um, uh, approval and kind of for additional fossil fuel infrastructure, refineries and such that ended up having very negative impacts on those communities. Um, I, another leader that I talk about is Maura Healy, who's the uh, Massachusetts Attorney General. She's actually just announced she'll be running for governor here in Massachusetts. Um, and she has been a leader in terms of leveraging the law and the public um, consumer laws in Massachusetts to sue ExxonMobil and um, the fossil fuel company for um, using Massachusetts consumer protection laws to say that they are greenwashing to when they say that their products are green and sustainable um, when, they, when they really are not. Um, I mentioned here uh, solar geoengineering and women, indigenous uh, women who are, have been resisting solar geoengineering. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this phenomenon of this approach to the responding to the climate crisis with investing in this idea that we could um, inject sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere and use airplanes that fly continuously around the world, injecting aerosols into the atmosphere to uh, block incoming solar radiation. So it's the idea of literally cooling the earth physically. Um, and there's growing uh, momentum and uh, scientists and, and um, some climate policy people calling for more research on this approach. Um, and indigenous people around the world in particular have been um, resisting this um, approach. And I'm also part of a network of scholars and researchers who have been resisting the growing advocacy and growing um, calls for public support for research in solar geoengineering research. As we know, supporting research is a political act. And the more you support something and, and public investment goes into certain um, areas, um, it builds capacity and, and legitimizes this approach. And so I'm, I've been active um, with, with multiple colleagues um, to kind of stand up against this approach. And many of the billionaires, including uh, Bill Gates, have been funding research in this. Um, and Harvard has a solar geoengineering research program that is the, the leading um, global 
uh, entity that is promoting and advocating for more and more research on solar geoengineering research. Um, we did, if anyone's interested, we did just launch this solar geoengineering non-use agreement. And you can see the uh, URL there, www.solargeoneng.org. Um, we're, we're asking for more um, uh, academics uh, to um, sign on to this call to uh, resist public funding and research um, uh, particularly public funding for research in this in this area. So I'd be happy to talk more about that. But I did mention that um, in in my book as as some of the different kind of leadership. If you move away from this technocratic way of thinking about climate, um, this I, this approach um, really is is quite dangerous and, and promotes injustices because there's no way to govern this in a way that is equitable and and just. So. Um, and the next chapter in my in my book is about leaders who are connecting climate and energy with jobs and economic justice. And uh, the Sunrise Movement and Varshini Prakash, who's one of the youth leaders here in the United States, um, really catalyzed uh, young people to call for a change in climate policy. And uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, one of the members of the squad, um, collaborated and, and they came up with the Green New Deal proposal, um, which was a whole new kind of climate policy that is about investing rather than um, kind of taxing. Um, and, um, and it really has changed, again, the, the approach of a much more integrated climate policy in, in, in focusing on climate energy within the context of all other, other social policies. Um, other, other leaders in this space um, I mentioned in the book are also not just uh, focused on um, uh, the kind of connecting jobs and, and climate and energy, but also really thinking about workforce training because it's not just creating the jobs, but where are those jobs and who and how who will have access to those jobs? Um, so, uh, Grid Alternatives um, and Erica Mackey are is a leader and an organization that is training uh, people in in communities. They're doing solar installations and then training people in in communities that have been not uh, participating and not um, uh, having access to financing for solar projects. And Esteban Kelly, who is the leader of the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives, has really been pushing for and advocating for and working toward um, integrating cooperative model of, um, of, of organizations in the burgeoning renewable energy um, uh, sector. So all of these leaders are kind of resisting the precarity that we've kind of become complacent with reclaiming the po possibilities of public investment and, and thinking about restructuring economic systems for a more inclusive prosperity. And I mentioned here, just in terms of the Green New Deal, uh, with a few students of mine, um, we published a paper last year kind of comparing emerging Green New Deal proposals, um, you know, it's, that have that have come up in different contexts and different places um, and different um, uh, jurisdictions. So, and and we kind of compared how these different proposals for Green New Deal policies uh, focus on linking infrastructure, equity, jobs, um, and 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 other other dimensions. So that that's an interesting paper that some of you might be interested in. Um, so the next chapter is about leaders who are connecting climate and energy with health, well-being, and nutritious food for, for all. Um, Robert Bullard is often considered the father of environmental justice here in the United States. He was among the first researchers to point out how disparate health impacts of infrastructure, fossil fuel infrastructure, other industrial uh, infrastructure um, was impacting Black communities um, much more than others. Um, Mildred McLean is an environmental justice leader who is among the many Black women in the United States who are standing up and saying they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, Gina McCarthy is currently the White House National Climate Advisor. She was previously the head of the EPA. Throughout her career, 
Um, she has been advocating for climate to be considered a public health issue. Um, and many communities around the country and around the world have actually now declared the climate crisis a public health emergency. Um, Jillian Heshaw is a lawyer and um, has been advocating and linking uh, black farmers in the South with climate and, and energy policy. Um, and Dorsetta Taylor is a researcher at Yale who is among the, uh, did really important work uh, documenting and identifying how white the environmental movement and environmental policy has been in the United States. So really pointing out that if we had a more inclusive environmentalism, uh, we would be paying attention to a lot more of these issues, particularly re regarding environmental health. Um, and I mentioned Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand here, as a leader who, um, you know, especially during the beginning of the pandemic, she was able to, you know, take strict measures but then communicate to people with empathy and compassion why these strict measures are needed based on the evidence and the science and that these measures are needed um, not just for your own health or the health of your family, but the health of the whole community or the whole country. And kind of this broader view um, of integrated uh, perspective is really what we need more in, in, in leadership. So um, I also have a chapter on clean transportation and leaders who are pushing and integrating justice issues and equity issues in, in transportation investments. Uh, representative Ayanna Presley is, is my representative here in Massachusetts in, in Congress, one of the members of the squad that I mentioned earlier. Um, she has really been a leader in pointing out that transportation investments um, are critical um, and opportunities to for um, promoting more equity, um, and that and that uh, the conventional focus on roads and bridges and infrastructure and transportation um, is is too narrow and simplistic, and we really need to broaden our our transportation policy and investments. Michelle Wu was just recently elected and became the new mayor of Boston, um, and she has been uh, she came up with a whole Green New Deal plan for Boston. Um, and is really among the most progressive cities right now we are because of this uh, very comprehensive plan that links climate and energy investments with transportation. And part of her um, call and what she's trying to do is, is make uh, trans public transportation free. Um, and which sounds like a novel idea. And, and a lot of people say, well, how, how is it gonna be paid for? But it's really just about restructuring um, the financing and what we're investing in and the possibilities for economic mobility when we um, make public transportation free um, are, are huge because Boston is a very um, um, segregated and economically uh, polarized uh, city. Uh, I mentioned Greta Thunberg here as a youth leader who just kind of demonstrated her own leadership in, in pushing for innovative transportation ideas when she came over to North America for the climate conferences and she didn't fly, she took um, a sailboat both directions across the Atlantic. Um, uh, th there's another chapter about housing for all and linking climate energy with housing. And, um, you know, I. There's such challenges with housing and how housing um, housing insecurity is really on the rise. Um, and uh, Representative Ilhan Omar has really been one of the leaders really pushing for huge new massive public investments in housing. Um, but it, it, it isn't a widespread um, um, issue or, or priority at this point. And um, in this chapter, I talk about an organization called Moms for Housing that was created after um, some four women who were housing insecure, in, homeless, didn't have, and mothers, uh, didn't have a place to live. They occupied illegally a vacant uh, building in Oakland, California. And um, the developer who owned the building um, wanted to evict them and call, the authorities came in and evicted them in you, literally using military guns and tanks to evict these four uh, women and their children in the middle of the night. And um, they uh, created uh, an organization building off that experience called Moms for Housing, which really advocates for housing as a human right and um, elevating the issue of so many people 
uh, who don't have a place uh, to call home. So um, it's it's a problem, and there's a big need for big public investments in in housing, um, and obviously that creates opportunities for um, more efficient energy, uh, um, clean energy in our, in our homes as well. The last example here I just want to mention is of some indigenous women in Canada who call themselves the tiny house warriors and they've um, connected their um, uh, association with the land as their home um, with uh, also building these tiny houses that they use to resist the building of a, the pipeline um, across Canada. So they're using these um, tiny houses to as part of their protest against fossil fuel infrastructure. So um, I, I want to just mention before I end here and open it up um, that I'm increasingly interested in um, financialization of climate governance and, and how this growing kind of um, wealth inequality and um, uh, the concentration of wealth and power has is is preventing us from really making the the changes that are needed for a more just and equitable climate resilient future. And um, for my sabbatical next year, I'm really interested in um, exploring in more depth kind of the role of academic work in societal transformation. And I'd love to hear um, some of some of your ideas about this. Um, you know, our our academic work is not necessarily, um, you know, traditionally thought of as promoting or facilitating uh, big social change. Um, obviously, we we all have different parts of, of our work that might be contributing or reflecting on and understanding how change happens. Um, but I think there's uh, really opportunities ahead to think about how higher education in particular, but our educational system more broadly and our research infrastructure um, can um, contribute to larger transformation. Um, and or are we just reinforcing things, right? Because uh, a lot of our, our policies and practices and priorities within our educational system is more for stability rather than uh, disruption and change. So um, um, one, one uh, example of that and, and something I'm interested in is how the fossil fuel industry and other, other interests have been contributing to um, research and university policies and university priorities. Um, and there's an organization called Uncoke My Campus and the Koch Brothers and the Koch Foundation is a big fossil fuel affiliated um, advocacy network here in the United States that has really um, had, a, had a broad influence in a lot of uh, higher education. Um, and so, you know, for for thinking about myself and my own, uh, and you know how we as researchers and educators uh, want to navigate through uh, in the next uh, decade or two, as the climate crisis gets worse, uh, the concentration of wealth and power seems to be getting worse, um, and so many other trends are going actually in the wrong direction, despite you know, efforts to, uh, toward a more sustainable and equitable future. What, how, how can we as, um, academics leverage our, our, uh, work to, to contribute in meaningful ways. And obviously it's complicated and there are a lot of different, um, uh, opportunities and, and challenges within that. And, um, so I'm, I'm very interested in kind of exploring, uh, novel and innovative ways um, for for educational systems and, and research to in, to connect. And I, I will mention here that I'm at Northeastern University, which is in Boston, which is probably it's a private university. So we are among the um, universities and we're very centrally located right in the heart of Boston. So own a lot of land um, and are building new buildings. And um, um, there's an increasing critique here that you know, public—I uh, mean, educational institutions as nonprofits 
get all these tax breaks uh, in terms of the land. We do, we're tax exempt because we're an educational institution, yet we, Boston in particular, for those of you who've been here, know that there's so many universities and hospitals and they're all tax exempt. So none of them have to pay any tax. So um, the, the Boston and Cambridge, the cities that um, these universities all are part of, um, you know, don't have the tax base because so much of the, the land is um, taken up by the university. So there's current conversations about how these universities could and should be contributing more to the city, um, to the cities in which they're in. Um, and obviously I, I connect that with, with work on, on climate justice and, and how um, we uh, in universities can be contributing to the, our communities and different kinds of partnerships and, and um, community led research and different different avenues there. I'm also, I'll just mention, I'm part of the faculty senate at Northeastern and we have a climate justice faculty senate resolution um, where we call on the university to um, make uh, climate justice more of a priority. Um, and and demonstrate leadership through our actions and our investments. Um, uh, we, you know, that it isn't necessarily uh, well received by the senior people in the in the university, but the faculty, many of the faculty and students are are working on that. And um, as I mentioned, a few other projects that I have ongoing that kind of explore the role of academia in societal transformation. Um, one is I'm part of this climate social science network, and um, which is a relatively new emerging network of social scientists who are really uh, working to explore in more depth and really understand some of this climate obstructionism and, and how and why there's been such resistance to um, taking action on, on climate and um, and one of, one of the papers we're working on is uh, looking at the, the influence of fossil fuel industry in academia and kind of setting a research agenda to understand that better. And um, the other paper is, is really thinking about what, what is the role of higher ed in climate justice and how can colleges and universities promote more societal transformation. And that's a paper I'm writing with a, a group of students, both PhD students and undergraduate students here. So um, I'll end here and we can open it up for, for questions. Um, I just want to end by saying, you know, I focus on a lot of my discussion about leadership and, and I think about leadership as not just elected officials or, um, you know, CEOs of companies, um, um, but really we're all, we're all leaders in different ways, right? In our communities, in our, the organizations we work with. Um, and I think we're at a point in human history where we really need to advocate more for systemic changes, um, which is hard because nobody knows exactly how to make bigger transformative change. And so um, wh when we're doing that, we really need to be very aware of these problematic power dynamics uh, of racism and sexism and, and other uh, discriminatory um, systems. And um, I think there, there are a lot of ways that we can all engage in terms of supporting cooperatives and new economic structures. Um, and um, I mentioned here, Mary Robinson, um, obviously who, who you are probably all familiar with, but um, you know, she has said that this kind of an approach um, may seem radical to some, but really if you think of it as like a people's first approach, um, then, and it doesn't seem that that um, that far off or that hard to to be thinking about. And I also honor here Shirley Chisholm is the first black woman in the, uh, to run for president in the United States in 1972. So quite a long time ago. Um, and clearly we you know we haven't come as far as one might think if uh, if um, we had the first black woman run for president in 1972. We still have uh, you know not very representative leadership, I would say, in, in many domains. So um, I think that's all. Thank you so much for uh, the discussion, for the time to share, and I look forward to, to the discussion. I will just mention, if anyone is interested in buying the book, all the author proceeds from this book go to NAACP's Environmental and Climate Justice Program. And um, I look forward to questions. Thank you so much.
actually that was really interesting um so rory um <clears throat> that was a great session here um that's a exciting talk and uh you kind of touched on at the end there but he asked if you could say a little bit more about particularly how you're conceiving of leadership and whether it's the same concept um that works across social movements uh participation in formal political institutions and academic work and if not what might the differences there be yeah so um i think yeah as i said i i'm not thinking i know leadership is a word that's used in a very um kind of narrow individualistic way right in a lot of in a lot of spaces uh, particularly in the corporate world, their leadership trainings on how to be effective and successful and make more money. <laughs> um, so, so I'm thinking more, um, as I said, thinking about leadership as kind of this collective action. And um, in the in the academic space, I think there's a lot of room for us also to be thinking about more collaborative work, um, and not the traditional model of like. Um, actually, there's an article that I I. Uh, suggest that's actually the hero model of academics that's like these single experts on their own doing this amazing work by themselves um i think that isn't uh i think that's also a model of of academic leadership that we can move away from as well in that we there's opportunities for us uh, to do more collaborative work it's actually we come up with more innovative um ideas when we connect and and collaborate with each other rather than you know are on our own doing our work with the door closed uh, in, in isolation. So um, I think the, the, the overall kind of approach that, I, that I'm kind of uh, putting forth here is, is more toward collective, inclusive, and collaborative efforts. Um, and, and so there's no formula or like exact mechanism for how, it's more about um, coming together to to explore and push for um, different different approaches. So I don't know if that if that answers answers the question. I noticed that almost everyone has the same name in the Zoom box. Um, so if anyone wants to rename themselves so that I can see who's actually here, <laughs> feel free to rename your um, uh, name in the Zoom box because it's a little bit funny to see all the all in one name. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, one of our uh, um, uh, comments from the floor there, but uh, Mary Robinson is an, an adjunct in the school, and uh, you can be introduced when, when you're visiting. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that person has such a group they're involved with. They're launching a document this afternoon on the role of universities and uh, contributing towards the uh, SDGs. Um, right. Yeah, I, I have a question myself, actually, but um, you know, you, you talked about the um, Green New Deal at different scales paper. Um, I was wondering, is there like a sense of uh, <clears throat> commensurability or incommensurability in, in um, those uh, those proposals or ideas? You know, did, was, was there an identifiable um, maybe kind of a divergence of approaches of, of you know, different ways uh, of thinking about these things and also um whether uh the the kind of ideas around just transition came into that at all yeah so um so yes the green new deal framework has has now been used you know in various jurisdictions um and um and to different levels of kind of effectiveness and actually toward implementation um, like the EU New Deal, and um, I think it's New York, um, has actually passed legislation that that um, um, focus uses this framework as an approach to integrate climate and energy policy with with other with jobs, in particular. And so, so there's but there's a great there is quite a lot of variety in in what or what how that framework is used and applied. Um, and then also the effectiveness of it. And, and what happened in the United States, at least, is it got politicized very early and very negative. Um, and um, so at this point, um, like the Biden administration right now is promoting Green New Deal-like investments in the infrastructure and build back better 
proposals, but they're not calling it Green New Deal. Um, so um, partly because politically it has it is not going to fly at this point. It's not practical because it got such a negative um, uh, backlash, I guess, um, as a, as a kind of um, impractical approach. So. Um, so there's quite a lot of variation, uh, but a lot of cities and towns and smaller jurisdictions and are are using it in 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 different ways. And sorry, Tommy, I forget what was your second question. Just whether um, um, uh, proposals or concepts around uh, just transition. Oh yeah. Left. Yeah. So um, that concept, yes, definitely is 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 coming up a lot. I think this frame of um, climate justice and social justice um, kind of is, in some ways is is coming up more in kind of the social movement space and the advocacy space um, um, but I but definitely uh, just transition framing and just sustainabilities uh, Julian Agumen, uh uses that that framing um, and um, but I think, and an interesting thing, I in my own um, work, I'm I'm conscious of using the word transition versus transformation, um, and in some ways, transition assumes you kind of know you're going from one place to another, and kind of assumes you know what that is, and transformation and transformative policies and transformative approaches is a little bit more broad. Uh, kind of acknowledging that we need big structural systemic change, but we don't know exactly where it where it'll land. Um, so that's that's an interesting follow on to that the you know these different framings and and words that we're using to describe uh, larger changes. Um. Rory notes that uh, it's great to see you working with Kevin Surprise on the campaign against solar geoengineering funding and asks, uh, how has this experience been advocating against research areas within universities? How is how has the uh, the campaign against research or uh, against solar geoengineering? Um, how is this? How's it been, I suppose, in uh, uh, what does it look like? And yeah. I'll, I'll jump in. Like, hi, the uh, Kevin's friend of mine. So I didn't, I didn't realize that you were working with. That it was great to see his name popping up when you were talking about that. Yeah. So I was just wondering how that that has been in, in thinking about you know leadership within yeah. academia. And we were saying where you're kind of trying to advocate in some sense against research funding for an area which you know yeah. has presents a moral hazard in in a sense. If you could talk about that, particularly in the given that it's in the same city, you know yeah. Harvard. Yeah, no, definitely. So this is an excellent question. And it's, it's frankly, it's gotten kind of nasty. <laughs> um, the, some of the academics um, who are quite adamantly promoting and advocating for research in this space, um, I've gotten quite defensive and I guess threatened by it, right? That, that the, the idea that some people think it's not a good idea to publicly fund um, this kind of research. And um, so, you know, on there's been, you know, tension on Twitter. And um, I actually uh, did a postdoc with David Keith, who is the head of the solar geoengineering, Harvard's solar geoengineering research program. So I know him quite well. I know him personally. And we've talked about our, you know, opposite divergent views on this uh, topic. And, um, you know, I think um, what what I get, I guess, uh, disappointed about is the, the degree to which um, those colleagues who are advocating very strongly for the for research in this space, are um, not equally advocating strongly for you know social change and political change and and it's almost like um, they they just assume like oh we won't be able to there is no social change that's possible here so we need a technological solution and and so that's where um, I think it's it's very valuable for those of us who do have a more social perspective 
to um, counter that. Um, and and the idea here is they are so heavily funded and so well connected. You know, there's been articles in the New York Times. There's been on um, national TV, and and they're like very well um, funded, uh, sourced, and and connected, and linked, and and everything. So. Um, and it's harder, it's, and it's not fun to be against something too, right? Like, there, nobody's got, nobody's funding the the group of folks who are trying to say, wait a minute, let's have a, let's talk about this, let's let's explore what are the risks. Um, um, but there's a lot of money uh, going into the supporting the pro side, so it's um, it, there's a big imbalance, I guess, and um, and a lot of kind of. Um, yeah, some some difficult interactions among among folks, and and the the call is not to say um, shouldn't do research on this necessarily. It's it's to be very aware of the risks of doing research in this space, and then also saying our tax dollars probably shouldn't shouldn't uh, fund research in this space because it just legitimizes it and builds builds that. Um, so um, that's that's kind of the argument there but yeah kevin is great uh he's a good friend of mine as well we we first met um knew each other from clark university where um i think or no maybe that's not I, yeah we, we go back <laughs> um martin sokol asks um <clears throat> given that there's a growing number of people who would agree that a green uh, transition transformation is needed um but would be concerned that it will be obviously costly and so the difficult question is who will pay for it and you know what what's the the kind of range of answers for that or what would you say to that yeah so um you know that comes up all the time like how how are we going to pay for this and um um I, I think there are a couple of things that are important to think about with that one is if we don't uh respond to the climate crisis we're going to have costs that are going to be even more high, higher than um the, the cost of proactively trying to to take action now. So um, there's there's that argument in terms of just the um, the costs uh, are higher if we don't move away from from uh, the current system. Uh, and the, the other the other piece is really about the resources we the amount of money that is not really the 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 challenge here there's plenty of, of of money to go around right it's just concentrated among a very few uh people um and so you know there's all kinds of mechanisms this whole idea of the billionaires being doubling their wealth in the past um um since the pandemic started uh is really problematic for not for everybody like there's no that that it's not even good for them i mean obviously they think it's good for them in a very narrow individualistic sense but like they this um you know so we really need to focus on how to get some of that those resources that are getting so concentrated among just a handful of people um uh redistributed to to invest in in other ways um and that's it in a more distributive way so so i mean there's there's lot there's multiple options for the financing and, and that gets into this whole um financial architecture right of so many of our of our systems not just our tax system but then other um uh fiscal policies and things that are that are for promoting stability um at the but doing that just ends up continuing to um, concentrate the wealth and and that is is can't I mean at some point something's going to break we can't can't really keep going like that um, so that's why I think we need to all pay more attention to that and I know some of some of you work on that very topic so yeah I think Anna you had your hand up Earlier. Thanks, Jenny. Sorry, I was Hi. I was I, uh, I was bumped out of the meeting a bit, and then I was struggling to rename myself. So I've been <gasps> posting a few bits in the in the chat there, just about contemporary debates. Um, I mean, very interesting stuff by um, George Monbiot in the Guardian. 
Guardian regarding a specific group in the Tory party that are lobbying against climate action. Um, suddenly they found an interest in poverty, you know, focusing on how the cost will increase them, but again, ignoring the cost that the current system already imposes on, on low and middle income households and things like that. So it ties in extremely well, I think, with, with what you were saying about, you know, who, who has power and control in these decisions on how there are sort of alliances between these groups. And it's the same group, pretty much, that were in the Brexit group, that were in, uh, you know, various elements, some familiar faces there. And some of them seem to have been recently promoted into the UK cabinet, which is, is not great. Um, but yeah, your, your point about uh, financialization um, and, and the importance of that is, is really, really key. I was on a, another webinar just before this one, which was looking at visions and creating new imaginaries and a lot of those focus on technologies um, and socio-cultural change but rarely are matters of governance policy and and costs and investments ever really discussed in those they're kind of assumed either assumed as degrowth and then sort of anti-capitalist or assumed to be capitalism as we know it in all its varieties um, so I think you know the efforts to kind of really lay clear the costs of what we're currently doing also need to be really clearly spelled out in order to have a proper comparison between you know what we're doing and also this kind of future discounting of course in economics is, is key as well yeah thank you a really interesting talk jenny thank you thank you we'll definitely hook you up with with uh, mary robinson when you're over as well yeah yeah that'll be great yeah she she did write a blurb on the back of my book and i saw her in glass go actually in, no, in November but it'd be great to connect more with her I'd, I'd heard that she was affiliated so that's great yeah yeah I think um yeah you know the phrase follow the money right <laughs> like I think we need to do a bit more of that um in in a lot of these conversations so that's what I'm starting to embarking on a kind of new direction to kind of understand that better so no, that's really, it's really important. Love to talk to you more about that. I've got this launch of this uh, EGU 2030 report coming up this afternoon, which is around the role of universities in contributing towards the SDGs. Cool. So that also kind of chimes in with some of the stuff that you were talking there about the role of universities in transformative change. I think we had three key pillars of action, and one of them is about diverse knowledges um, yeah. and values, and one of them is about interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, and the other is around partnerships, so absolutely like singing from the same hymn sheet. As, okay, as, great, as great. Amazing. Well, I'll look, I'll look that up, that report as well. Thank right. you. Yeah, and I've got to run now, so thanks very much. Yeah, we'll great. See Good to see you. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Chairs and, and Rory. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, we're just at the end of the hour. So um, on behalf of uh, Trendy Geography, I'd like to say thank you again uh, to Professor Jenny Stevens for a really engaging uh, seminar. Great. Well, thank you all and uh, look forward to seeing some of you. Are, you. are you back in person yet or not really? Doesn't look like. Um, just about. Teach, teaching is uh, for, for, we had, uh, right before the, the one I was running from was the first in-person meeting I've been to other than you know one-on-one -on -one with students yeah. and classes are back in person yeah, yeah um but all our kind of staff meetings a lot of people are are you know working from home and that's you know particularly with you know after two years of childcare, um having shifted around there's a big discussion here as I'm sure there is in in, in uh, northeastern and obviously in the U.S. more broadly about the kind of phased return to the workplace and um yeah. so we're we're only really I mean, the government is kind of nudging that, but it's uh, they've only started the, the process. It was a week ago they launched their returning phase, return to workplace. And, uh, you know, it really depend sector by sector. I kind of expect in academia, there'll be a lot of um, people staying uh, out of the office most of the time. Um, okay. you know, I think well, maybe, by the, maybe by the summer or, or the autumn. Well, I, I would not yeah. expect in the summer, there'd be very few people there, but in the autumn, yes. And, yeah. You know, we can use you as a fulcrum to gather people <laughs> into the into the which would be great. Right. Um, yeah, right. um, it, it, it has been challenging to, 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 to gather in person at times, but I think it'll, yeah. we're on the easing path now. Great. Well, thank you all. Thank you so um, much. Great. Nice to see you all.